Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. So this is the, uh, the last of my talks, I guess, for probably a while. I'm not sure uh, if I'll be invited back. But um, so it kind of wraps up a whole series that we've been doing here on, uh, on memory processes within the brain. And so I guess we culminate today with how do we improve memory. So I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are really interested in how we can improve our memory. And uh, I'll try to, I'm trying to essentially link up with what you know, popular beliefs are in the popular journals and um, with basic science. So it's going to be a bit tricky for me. And unfortunately, I probably don't have the exact answer, like what you can exactly do to improve your memory. But hopefully, I have some strategies. And then I'd also like to, as we wrap up, hear some of your strategies. So maybe you can tell me what you do to improve your memory. So as what I've done in the past, I start out with a little review just to get everybody on board. And the reviews get shorter and shorter as we go along. So the first talk that I'd done in this series was different memories, different brain regions. So we'll just touch on that to make sure that we all understand where I'm coming from. <coughs> Pardon me. And then my, one of my graduate students talked about one of the uh, mechanisms underlying memory formation of the brain, long-term potentiation. So again, I'll touch on that. And then last time I was here, I talked about what the look of a memory was. So how your brain, you know, how do we track down memories in the brain, which again, is not that easy to do. So today, we're going to be going into this idea about how you're getting stuff from a short-term memory store into a long-term memory store based on all these other things that we know. And then what are the evidence-based tips to improve our memory? And as I said, it's probably going to be, it's not like going to be, oh, that's perfect. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go take this pill and improve my memory. Um, it's, you know, unfortunately, as me as a basic scientist, I can't make that leap just yet. But I, again, I can give some ideas about what we know from basic science and what is out there in the popular press. So starting off with the different brain regions, different memories idea, is that we talked about the first uh, week that I gave these lectures, we talked about different parts of the brain. So this would be a cross section of the brain. If you know somebody sliced my, the top of my head right off and pulled off my skull, you would actually look down and this would be a bird's eye view of the top of the brain. So on the front, we have our prefrontal cortex, which is really important for us as humans, but it's also important for aspects of working memory. So just keeping things online when I'm talking with you right now. Uh, we go back, as we're moving back in the brain, we go to another part called the striatum, or the caudate, which I talked about, and that's involved in procedural memory. So how to ride a bike, how to drive a car, things like that, that we do, you know, our actions. Um, I'm going to skip over the cerebral cortex, because that's kind of everything, but getting down to more of the um, basic brain structures, the amygdala, sitting down close to this part of the brain called the hippocampus, that's where our emotional memories are stored. So when we're anxious for unknown reasons, um, when we all of a sudden remember something emotional in our lives, that's where that memory is being stored within the amygdala. It's really important for kind of anxious moments in our lives, but then it stores those memories. So then the one part of the brain that <coughs> we had focused, or I'd focused on a lot, was called, is called the hippocampus. And I'm not the only one who's focused on this as a really important part of the brain for processing memories. Many, many people in neuroscience look at the hippocampus in terms of its function in declarative memory, and of those types of memories are episodic and semantic. So the one that we, so we keep funneling down in this, these series to talk about memory for facts, memories for events. So those types of things are the ones that most of us really want to remember, you know, how to do well in, why, you know, you do well in school, how to remember all the facts that I've been talking about in this uh, series. So all of that being processed within this little part of the brain called the hippocampus. So that's where we focus down our series of talks. And then going beyond that to say, well, what is it, what is special about the hippocampus that might be storing memories? Why, do, how does it store memories? So we talked about what Hebb brought up a long, long time, well, somewhat long ago, 1949, about the fundamental physiological <coughs> assumption, which is whenever a nerve falls and crosses a synapse, it becomes easier for later impulses to do so. So when you see something, you see it again, it's easier for that nerve impulse to go. And that's essentially what Hebb thought of as a memory. And then he went down even further and said, when a neuron A fires, it takes place in firing another neuron B. Some change in A or B takes place which increases A's capacity to fire B in the future. So again, you, you study something, the next time you see it, you remember it. And that's exactly, that was the, you know, the essential of what Hebb talked about, again, back in 1949. So again, this, this big book that he wrote, there was this one little sentence in there that people really grasped onto and said, okay, if we can figure out what this is, we can understand how memories are stored in the brain. So from that point on until current research, People have been looking at this idea about long-term potentiation. 
So again, I can, I'm not going to go over that again, but it's this idea of exactly what Heb talked about, is that when you have one neuron in the brain firing repeatedly activating a second neuron, what will happen is you'll get this electrophysiological response, and this will be important, so this is just the response of this neuron um, after once this neuron stimulates it, so there's an electrical change, but if there's repeated stimulation, as it says, so you keep learning something, 2 plus 2 is 4, 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 there's repeated stimulation, after a while, one week later, let's say, when you see 2 plus 2, you know that the answer is 4 because you have this big electrical response. So this is where, let's say, the number 4, the answer to that problem is stored. So this long-term potentiation, again, this one figure, but thousands of people work on this in neuroscience, to try to understand how this process works and what it means when, with the, for the storage of memories. So it's important to look at. So again, when, so thinking about now going to what does a memory look like in the brain, one of the things is people say, this is what a memory looks like in the brain. Before learning, you have a little sort of two plus two, nothing, no response. After you learn it, after you do your math tables, two plus two is four and there's a big response and that's what a memory might look like. So a change in the electrical properties. So that's what I spent last time in this uh, course talk or this series talking about what does a memory look like? And again, we go back, you know, like there's, there's I, I think a lot of this fundamental work was thought about, you know, a long time ago and people now are really starting to explore it with the new techniques that are available today. But in 1917, Santiago Ramon y Cajal thought that a memory would be stored through the establishment of these new pathways. So you have a bunch of neurons here and as they continuously get, we'll just put up his next one, as there's long efforts requiring attention and reflection, there's a growth in these neurons and they change their relationship. So they start to change their relationship, they're easier to activate, there's a reorganization of memory areas, and that's what a memory would look like in the brain. So in 1917, he came up with this and he was, he was a classic neuroscientist, he looked through a microscope and he drew all these pictures, he drew all these neurons, and he thought, well, possibly there's a change in the relationship that will store information. And I, this is, a, I like this statement because it's like what we think about in long-term potentiation and really in any sort of memory is that it only takes place after long efforts requiring attention and reflection. So thinking about these things, you know, processing them, rehearsing them. So all of these things that come up as we go through to try to understand what does a memory look like to current techniques that, I mean, this paper was, I think, published in 2013, where you can actually visualize individual neurons in the brain. So this, you know, uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal didn't, wasn't able to draw a neuron like this, but we can now, with our microscopes and our technology, really get these high um, resolution pictures of neurons and even get closer in and closer in to actually look at what structural changes are taking place once a memory is starting to be formed. So you see that there's this yellow arrow, there's one little connection here, and as the memory is starting to get, let's say, rehearsed or stored in this brain, another little thing blips out and it's there, and now they're sort of growing together. So there is this really microstructure reorganization of the brain. But what I brought up last week, and I mentioned this to my class, is that you can't, your brain just can't keep growing. I mean, you think about all the numbers of memories that we're capable of storing, your brain can't keep getting bigger and bigger because it will just explode. So what seems to be the current way of thinking is that there is this reorganization, sort of what uh, Cajal had said. So in some cases, you would have you know, these little connections, so all these little blips here, they're called spines, are where neurons communicate with each other and talk to each other. So you'd have some that appear, some that grow out, and some that will actually disappear. So you see one here, and then after learning or after memory is formed, it's gone. So there's a reorganization. Some get stronger, some get weaker. And again, you can see that with these higher um, new technologies, this, you know, these images that show that these things are growing out, making new connections. And at the same time, some, like up here, I guess that one's being formed, but some of them are actually disappearing. There's a red one over there that's gone here. So there's this constant movement of uh, parts of the brain, of microstructure of the brain. So this is what we think a memory looks like. And again, I went over this because I think this is really important to set up how we think about how memories are stored in the brain and how we can improve them and how we can show that a memory is improved based on this understanding of what a memory looks like in the brain, how it's being processed, and where it's being processed. 
So HM was the, is again, it was one of these, the quintessential case study in history that set off all of this research into understanding memory being processed by this part of the brain called the hippocampus and all these, you know, these, this long-term potentiation, these structural changes. So all these really important things, this one case study, because he had his hippocampus removed for, because he had intractable seizures. So his seizure activity was not controlled with drugs. So at the time, and even they do this today, they remove that part of the brain that is, uh, was responsible for setting off his seizures. But what they noticed is, so seizures were gone, but what they noticed is he was, so this is a, this is a figure taken from the original work, so this number of errors. So he was able to learn information within a, a day, so the initial test, he was able to learn. So he had his working memory, was fine, everything was good. But then when he came back the next day for the retest, he was unable to retain it in long-term memory. So you can see he improves really well, and then each time he comes back, he's, I mean, he's still okay, but he, he's much worse than a control subject. So he can't retain this information. So he's not able to really, what, what people talk about is the transfer of information from short-term memory into this long-term memory store. And that's what, you know, again, I think that's the key to memory research is to understand, first of all, why certain things get into long-term memory, but also how to facilitate that process. So that's what we're talking about today. So how do we improve our memory? So this has been a, I think this has been a real challenge for me to put this talk together because there are so many books out there. So Memory Seek is real memory improvement. Memory improvement made easy, oh no problem. Memory improvement with deep trance now hypnosis. Learn faster, remember more, memoryimprovementtips.com. Uh, Ron White's Memory in a Month. I mean, it's, it's amazing, oh, six CDs, so that, I don't know if that's a month worth of work, but so all these things that, you know, I'm sitting here and, you know, people ask me, well, you do memory research, how do we, how can I make myself remember things? And I don't have the clear answer because, and I don't think anybody else does, because if you, you know, even do an Amazon search or a Google search for memory improvement, you get thousands and thousands of hits. Everybody has their idea, and if somebody had the answer, then the rest of us would be out of business. So, which is good for me, because I don't think, anybody has the true answer. But that people don't like to hear that from you know, me. I mean, being a basic scientist, I'm very skeptical of a lot of this stuff because when I look at memory, I think of it this way. I think of these circuit diagrams. I think of parts of the brain. So there's that amygdala, there's that hippocampus, there's that caudate that we were talking about. And you have the initiation of memory consolidation, modulating influences, so how do we strengthen our memory? There's all these factors that are coming into play to say, well, first of all, where is this memory? So you have the experience and then the memory comes somewhere and ends up somewhere, which we're not always all that clear of. Um, but then the big question is, well, what are those influences that can enhance that? So again, as a basic researcher, we're looking at these really in-depth uh, processes at the genetic level and the cellular biochemical level. And it's, it just gets so far removed from, you know, somebody saying, well, how can I remember what I just learned today? You know, and it's like, well, you could actually increase you know, this CREB gene and increase these stop codons and you know, increase all this and change that and do this. And it's like, but that's not feasible, that's not possible. So what are some strategies? So we start to, so I spent a lot of time now, I, I mean, a couple of weeks, looking at, well, what do we know from animal models where we can really explore what memories are looking like in the brain and then say, well, what do we know about out there that can improve? What are some memory improving techniques that people like to uh, try to do to actually help improve their memory? So again, it's one of those things where I'm trying to bridge the gap between this mainstream like luminosity, which again, I don't think is, has been evidence-based to show that you can actually improve your memory function, but how do we figure out what's mainstream <coughs> and then link that up with what we know about basic science? And that again is a really, it's a, it's a challenge. And I mean, this is something that, again, I think is important for sort of outreach and thinking about how we can improve our memory. And it helps me to get away from, you know, thinking, okay, this one little box here, this one biochemical can actually improve your memory. But you can't, you know, people in, in basic science, we increase these, we change the levels of these different biochemical pathways all the time. And we can say, yeah, we see improved memory. Or people will genetically change the, the receptors here, you know, do something to change the function of the cell, but that's not feasible in humans. So what, it, what is feasible? So this is what my plan was, and again, this could be kind of a letdown, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that it will be at least give you some insight into 
how you know we can get information into long-term memory store. So I put this figure up in the first talk that I gave, and it's you know you you have your learning, your environmental stimulus, whatever that is. It gets into your sensory memory. It can decay. You can forget it, but you can actually get it then into encoded into a short-term memory. And this is now the key: is once it gets into the short-term memory, again you can decay interference. So you know something I just talked about five minutes ago might be gone. So you might think wait, what was that LTP thing that he said? So that's probably forgotten, unless you're able to pay attention and then rehearse it, and then it gets, goes through this consolidation process, which is what I really study in my lab, is how we you know, consolidate memories into this long-term memory. So it gets there, but then you know, how do you keep it there without it being interfered, or you know, I know it's somewhere, it's on the tip of my tongue, it's on the tip of my tongue somewhere, where is it? How do I get it out of that long-term memory store? So these are the challenges. So a lot of people would say, well, you pay attention, you increase your attention. Well, how do you do that? So maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. How do you keep rehearsing it? You know, so, and I think, this, I think these, uh, you know, these mnemonic devices are really important. People use them all the time to think, okay, so I just learned that person's name. What does that remind me of? What's, and they start linking it together. And I think that's a really good strategy to get things into this long-term memory store. And then again, the consolidation. So this, the big mystery step from a short-term memory into a long-term memory. Why do some things get there? Why do some things not? That's, that's really, in my mind, the key. And I don't know, the brain somehow makes that decision from what's going here to what's going here. And we can, but so can we influence what goes here to here to help us remember better? So we'll see, maybe. So one of the things that I came across as I was searching is this hit the local coffee shop for some caffeine. So caffeine obviously helps you pay attention, right? I mean, I'm drinking a coffee right now to be a bit sharper, um, and that can actually, you know, that will help this first stage, this attention. And whether or not it'll help the rehearsal is not too clear, but what, what I have looked into is how it helps that consolidation process. And one thing that caffeine really does, so again, if we think about what a memory looks like in the brain, it's these, this, these growth processes or this long-term potentiation. And caffeine seems to do both of those. So this is a, I mean, it's not probably the best picture I could find, but I just, I wanted to put up some representative pictures of lots of, you know, again, basic science. Um, so when they were giving caffeine to these animals, what they found is that you can see that this neuron is quite a bit larger than the control, and this side is also supposedly larger than the control. So there is some effect of caffeine to increase the growth of your actual neurons. And that's been, scientifically, it's been shown several times that that, that effect happens. So again, you're increasing the structural components of the brain. And again, if that's what a memory looks like, then that could be one way to improve your memory. And so it also does promote that long-term potentiation, that electrical response. So I showed, you know, before when you're learning 2 plus 2, there was just a little blip. So that would be kind of here. So you'd say, what's 2 plus 2 is 4? 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 plus 2 is 4. So now you have a bit of a more potentiated response in your brain when you see 2 plus 2. And now you throw caffeine on top of that. And what happens is it actually goes up higher. So that response is maybe quicker, or it's, you know, the speed of processing is faster. So, I mean, I don't, I don't work for any coffee companies, um, but I do think that there is some benefit to caffeine intake to help to improve and consolidate memories into long-term memory stores. And I think there is some evidence, and probably most of us have, ha have had that experience where if we're drinking coffee, we're paying attention, and, uh, and then at the same time, if you have coffee later during that consolidation process, it seems to push those memories into a long-term store. Now, I wanted to stay away from too much of the, uh, of the effects of different drugs on memory formation because I don't want to encourage drug use, but lots of different drugs, lots of stimulants will actually increase memory uh, function to a certain level. So the other one that we had talked about um, a little bit of time ago is spacing it out. So again, this is more applicable to when you're studying for an exam. And you know, you know this, like you're not supposed to cram for an exam. You should take time out. So breaking up information in small chunks, review consistently over a long period of time. Like that's, people always say that you shouldn't study, you shouldn't cram at the last minute. You should keep on, you know, learning this information as you go along. But it's true, there's lots and lots of evidence that this effect is really, really strong to help improve memory. So again, we look at our, the electrical models. So 
say this long-term potentiation saying, well, what happens if you give, so there's two, there's a black and there's a red arrow here. So if you give one electrical that 2 plus 2 is 4, 2 plus 2 is 4, and then you follow it up right away with 2 plus 2 is 4, 2 plus 2 is 4, within 10 minutes, you can see that, yes, you do learn, but the second amount this on top of that doesn't improve that electrical response, doesn't potentiate that electrical response anymore. If you spread it out, I think that's probably about a 30 minutes, it's the same effect. There's no potentiation. But if you spread it out after 60 minutes, so you see that first one gives that potentiation, then the next one actually potentiates it even more. So there's a big increase if you spread out those, that sort of that input that you're getting. And that, again, that makes sense so, to me because you think about when you're, when you're you know, encoding or rehearsing and you have this decay, you have interference, right? So you have less interference in this case at the electrical level. So at the real sort of physiological level, what Hebb had talked about as you know, the fundamental assumption of memory and what people have studied for quite some time, and you can actually show experimentally that you spread out those stimulations and you can improve the potentiation of your neurons. So that's good. So there is real evidence that spacing it out, you know, in, in reducing that amount of interference really helps to improve memory function. And we've seen it in animal models, so we can, so this is just a, this is, we use this test regularly in the lab, it's called the water maze test. It's a spatial task, so the animal has to learn that there's a, uh, I guess a platform right here, so it's swimming around this water and it hits this platform and over time it learns it. So what we can do is we can say, all right, we're gonna give you, little mouse, 20 trials right in a row, one, two, three, four, six, seven, up to 20, so that's mass training or we're gonna give that little mouse spaced out trials. So we'll give it one trial, wait five minutes, give it another one, wait five minutes, give it another one. And then we can test their memory. So we say, how well do you remember where that platform is? And hopefully you can see the color differences. So this is actually where the platform used to be for both cases, and red means more time spent in that area where, that, where they remember where that platform used to be. So you can see that in the masked group, the ones that were cramming all that information in, they have really poor, poor memory for that, where the memory for that platform, but the ones that were spaced out have a really super memory, really, really strong memory for that exact location. So it's true to, you know, it's evidence-based that if you're spacing out your learning, there's less interference, um, and you can get things into a long-term memory store for a longer period of time. So this test, I think in this case, took place a week after they had learned it, so they have still really good memory recall for that uh, event. And then, so this is a bit of an abstract way to show this, but there is in fact, with spaced out training, uh, the, which is the red line, there's more structural changes. So remember I said, what does a memory look like? It's these structural changes, you gain some, you lose some. So in fact, what you see here is this is the control, let's just say the, the normal baseline level of structures that are found in this hippocampus. If you give mass training, you actually lose more. Right? So you're not only showing poor memory, you're actually losing structures that are underlying that memory function. Whereas if you're giving your space training, you actually see an increase in those structures. So there is, there's a lot of evidence that actually spacing it out really happens. And you know, I mean, again, that's really hard in our day-to-day -day lives to say, okay, hold on, let's just you know, take a step back. Okay, now I'm ready for the next bit of, bit of information. I mean, we're just getting blasted with information daily. So it's really hard to space out what you do during the day, but sometimes take a time out. That's why I put that up there. So take a step back and you come here and you think, okay, let's just forget about everything that I was, you know, trying to remember before. Now I have a little bit of time and that memory, those memories hopefully will get consolidated. Hopefully not interfered with, but you know, that's another challenge in all this. So sleep. Again, these, you know, this is like, probably things your mother told you, get some sleep, you know, go to sleep, sleep, study sleep, then sleep some more. So, and again, this is stuff that's really been shown and there was, I think I have, I think this is where I just got a, an update on a paper yesterday that came out in the journal Neuroscience that shows even more evidence about how important sleep is for, you know, the structures that are involved in forming a memory. So during sleep, the brain strengthens new memories. This has been shown experimentally. Um, it's been shown with animals, with humans. There's a lot of evidence that um, sleep really does help to consolidate memories, and it probably gets rid of some that you don't actually need. How the brain decides that is that's the mystery. Um, and the other thing is that if you, 
Uh, if you, s you need to sleep, obviously, before, let's say, again, this is more applicable to exams, but you need to sleep before the exam. So it reduces your levels of stress. And stress is a really, it's one of those funny ones where stress can actually help you pay attention, help you get encoding, but too much stress will, in fact, impair memory function. So there's a, there's a really tricky balance that you have to get there. Coffee can help bring up your stress levels, but too much coffee can push you over the edge, and then it all falls apart. So what is the evidence? So again, this is um, looking at those, uh, what people do in laboratories is they often put animals through sleep deprivation. And when you see sleep deprivation, if we think about the electrical response in the brain, that potentiated response, there's, if, I mean, it, again, it's hard to see some of this, but you'll have to trust me, that when you look at a sleep deprived um, brain, there's less of that potentiated response as compared to a control, so a, a, an animal that's sleeping on its normal cycles. So there's, there is that electrical potentiation that's not present when you are sleep deprived. And I thought this was really good. So again, looking at um, the structures. So what does a memory look like in the brain? It's those structural components. If you look at a control versus, a, again, a rat who's been sleep deprived over five days, what you see is that in the control, so again, all these little spines that are coming off this neuron are, you know, it's pretty full, it's pretty, I guess, hairy looking, bumpy looking, versus an animal that has been sleep deprived. And you can see, especially when looking down at this, comparing these two, there's a lot fewer of those little bumps, and this one as well. So you can see that the structural processes, like when you have that mass training um, with sleep deprivation, you see those structural processes starting to disappear. So the, the foundation, the structure of the memory is actually not even there. It's almost gone when you, get, when you become sleep deprived. So I think, again, that's, you know, it's an important factor just in our day-to-day -day lives to keep getting our sleep. And unfortunately, as you know, young kids sleep you know, all the time, but as we age, we tend to sleep less. And then that's also starting to become associated with uh, memory loss. And that's what, so that brings us to this. This is a Journal of Neuroscience article. Like I said, it just came out yesterday, so I thought I'd put it in here because, so this was the, the headline that came out um, that I got in my emails, uh, lost sleep could mean lost neurons. And so when I looked at the study, you actually see that. So as these, as again, these mice, I think, were um, sleep deprived, again, what you see is that if they're rested versus extended awake, you can just see it, hopefully, that you know, the density of these little structures is decreased when you're sleep deprived. So the parts of the brain that are really critical for forming new memories are disappearing when you're sleep deprived. And that, I mean, that's kind of a scary thing, but an easy thing to rectify, right? You just get more sleep, maybe take a nap, maybe you know, just try to, try to control your sleeping a bit better so that you do get that, you know, the right amount of sleep, whatever that might be. Okay, work it out. So, or move your, so actually the, it did say move your butt, but I didn't want to say that because I was told by my wife that that's not very appropriate to say butt, so I said bum. So move your bum, right? So exercise, like again, these are things that, you know, just tell me what pill I can take to improve my memory, but that, it's not that easy. But exercise is really an easy thing to do. So half hour of aerobic exercise can improve brain processing speed, other important cognitive abilities. So that's the mainstream title, right? So what is the evidence? There's tons and tons of evidence that exercise is really, really important for keeping your brain healthy, um, keeping blood flow to your brain well, keeping oxygen, that's what your brain needs. It uses a lot of blood. It uses like 30% of the blood pumping through your body. So it's a, it's a hungry little machine up there. And so the more you exercise, the more the you know, oxygen gets up there, blood gets up there. But it also, show, people have shown this over and over that you increase the number of neurons that are really critical um, for forming memory. So again, this is a, this is a mouse study, so they have non-runners versus runners. And what you can see is that, three, so they're looking at the number of new neurons. So new neurons being born within this hippocampus, within this part of the brain, is really important for replacing dying neurons. So I said as we age, right, we, lose, we get less sleep, our neurons start to die within this hippocampus. So you want to replace those neurons. So it does happen naturally. You can replace those neurons just as a natural biological process. But with running, you can actually increase the number of new neurons that are being born or that are becoming available within that hippocampus. 
So this was actually 14 days, 28 days after running. You can see that the runners show a lot more of these new neurons in that part of the brain, in the hippocampus. And that's, again, this is what people have shown over and over, and it's really important that these new neurons are important to help facilitate uh, memory function and to keep things in the long-term memory. So if we go back to once you get them into long-term memory, how do you retrieve them? Well, you keep these neurons alive to be able to retrieve those memories. So that's what exercise seems to be doing. And this was just another one that I thought was really interesting because what they're looking at is, so oftentimes in these studies, you know, mice and rats and animals are a bit deprived. So they're not in these nice you know, rooms and they're not living in really nice places. So what they looked at, these researchers looked at, well, let's say if you do have these um, really nice environments, really enriched environments, they call it in, in science, so, or in neuroscience, so what you can see is that, so these two groups are the exercise groups, and these are the sedentary groups in this case, and then they have different environmental conditions, so enriched, which means a nice environment, or uh, a sort of uh, dull environment, and what you can see is that even those animals in the enriched environment really show that increase in, um, in new neurons within the hippocampus when they're exercising. So like what you'd see in a human. So there's a lot of really good work that's going into you know, the basic understanding of how exercise really does, can improve our memory function. And it seems that it's doing this through the generation of these new neurons in the hippocampus that will help support uh, memory formation, memory retrieval possibly. Okay, so then one, so we're getting closer to the pill, right? So omega-3s, so dietary fatty acids. So omega-3s and omega-6s seem to really do, I mean, you know, people have been touting this for a while. And again, there is actual evidence that shows this. So this is, again, these are things that I was looking up as I was thinking about this. What's, you know, easy to do? So change your diet. I mean, you know, change your diet in general, but definitely these omega-3, 6 fatty acids seem to really boost your capacity to uh, form new memories, let's say, or store memories. And again, we look at the electrical properties, so that long-term potentiation. So you're saying two plus two is four, two plus two is four. Yes, the normal person can remember that. They show the, you know, the potentiated response when I say, well, what is two plus two? Four, no problem. But if they've given, so these are again animals, these aren't people, but if they've given these animals the omega-3s, you can see that there's an increase. There's much more of that electrical response. So it's almost like they got it even better. It's much more consolidated, it's much facilitated, or it's, the memory's been facilitated. And so this is where we, again, we look at now just saying, well, you know, what, is, what, is, what do omega-3s just do to neurons? So these neurons are just sitting in a petri dish, in a culture, and you can actually keep neurons alive for quite some time and give different treatments to them. So when you, when you actually add on omega-3s, you can see that this neuron, there are these two anyways, have a lot more of those structures. So that structural component that seems to be really important for uh, memory, the foundation of memory. And if it's deficient in omega-3s, you can see that it's a bit smaller, right? So there's fewer of those wiry things coming off of there. So these neurons are less able to connect up with their partners. And then we go back to what Heb talked about, you know, those neurons that fire together wire together, well, there's a better chance that these neurons are actually going to fire together, first of all, and then wire together really easily because they have a lot more of that structural capability. So when you're deficient in omega-3s, the neurons seem to actually start shrinking down a little bit. And again, there's, I just thought I'd put this up because it's, it shows a very similar uh, replication of this, that without omega-3s, you can see that these neurons are just less connected with their neighbors, but with omega-3s, they actually do form these more structures and probably have a better chance to be connected together. Uh, and then, I mean, if this was in your brain, to form a memory, right? So these are in a dish, so they're just kind of sitting there, but omega-3s really do seem to have that um, ability to increase the structural components of a neuron. So that's, you know, again, I think we're getting close to that pill. So I'm gonna kind of finish up with a, because I do want to get to, you know, your strategies about memory enhancement. But so this was actually my PhD advisor back at McGill, um, and he wrote this paper back in 1998. So it's a bit. I mean, I don't think it's dated. I think it's actually really, you know, applicable across dates. Um, so cognitive enhancement is it an everyday event? So you know, people do things all the time that you can, you know, remember 
things. You can keep the, you can use these strategies to remember things for the for a long term. But we humans have pretty good memories. Like it's we're pretty decent at remembering things. So I think what how Norman put it is that you know cognitive enhancement is not only possible but it is an everyday reality. So we're always remembering things. We have really good memories if you think about it. Yes, as we age we start to forget things, but still I think you know we do actually go through enhancement every day. Um, so again, I talked about the different types of drugs. So in those days in well back in the 60s, 70s people were really looking at caffeine, sugar, um, nicotine, amphetamine, cocaine. I mean, like I said, I don't want to push drug use, so it's not a perfect strategy, but lots of, subs lots of common substances um, will improve the retention of memory. So we're all drinking coffee, we're all walking somewhere, we're all doing this, we're all doing that. So I think there, you know, we are actually engaged in these strategies that will help um, enhance our memory. And then, so this is the other, this is why, I mean, I probably shouldn't have put this up because it kind of ends on a bit of a negative note, but you know, many individuals were already functioning cognitively at or very close to the maximum level possible. So if it is true, then only a relatively small enhancing effect of cognitive enhancement should be expected. So again, I don't like, that's where I think you can't just make a pill and say, okay, I'll remember things so much better because we might be really at our capacity for uh, memory enhancement, cognitive enhancement, memory retention. So it's, um, so you know, keep up with the strategies that we're doing, and that's probably what you know will help us to remember things the most. <coughs> so that's where I did want to end. So I did want to say that again, going back to that title, is it is an everyday event. So if you know, if you're not too shy, what works for you? You know, what strategies have you found that you can enhance your memory?